Well, um, I just got back Thursday evening from being in Guatemala. Um, I do too. I love Guatemala. I like this. Awesome. All right. Um, we, went, we left Monday morning. Um, I went uh, with Paul Richardson and my wife, Amy, and my brother, Kevin, who oversees our, all of our outreach here, and Ruth Wittenbrook, our overseas, she's our global outreach extraordinaire here at Westridge. And then uh, that's um, Claudia, who works with us from, um, from World Help. And uh, we went down to capture what God has been doing over the last seven years as we've been working in Guatemala. And we had a chance to visit the two villages that we've partnered in, uh, one being Guaycon del Paso and another one called El Cimiento, which is way up a mountain. And uh, had a chance to see the water wells that we've built and how God's allowed us to bring water to these two villages. Uh, we've had a chance to build churches. We've had a chance to build some homes. Um, and we've built some playgrounds, some classrooms, and uh, just a chance to just see the people again that God has, has allowed us to, to, to be connected with over the last seven years. And we also got a chance to look at some new possibilities, some new opportunities. But... Um, being in Guatemala brings uh, a bit of perspective to the topic I want to speak uh, on this morning, which is the, the sacred cow topic of, of worry. Um, on Wednesday of this past week, I was standing in a little village uh, called Teculatan. And if you go to Guatemala with us, and you should, um, then you've been to this place. It is a trash dump. Uh, it's, it's a village that, that really surrounds this dump. People come from all over the, 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 the country and they dump their stuff here. And these families come out every single day and they are um, picking through trash, trying to find things that they could sell, pieces of metal, pieces of plastic. And, and you know, I, I started thinking about things that we worry about. We worry about appearances. We worry, we, we are overwhelmed with likes and followers and these, th these families here are hoping just to find a, a little piece of metal to be able to sell so that they can eat that day. Um, they're picking through trash to find scraps of food um, that they can give to their children. Um, I had a chance to, to meet this little boy. His name is Marvin. And one of the ministries that we work with there called Hope of Life rescues babies and children from the mountains uh, who, who are dying. I don't really know how old Marvin is, to be honest with you. He could be anywhere from 3 to 15. Um, but I started thinking about things that we worry about as parents and whether our kids are popular or whether they have the right clothes or the right shoes or why they didn't get home, you know, chosen for homecoming court. Um, Marvin's mom is hoping that, she, that he'll just survive malnutrition and water diseases and be able to get out of that little bed and walk again. Um, I, we had a chance for the very first time to meet Pastor Aldelso and his wife, Marta, and, and, and their children. And we sat inside their living room, which also serves as a, as a church in a, in a village called Sean Rio. And um, there, this, this little living room church is, is the only thing I've ever sat in that's hotter is a sauna. We were just drenched sitting in this room. And I started thinking about just things that we overwhelm and stress about as parents, whether, you know, our son or our daughter is going to be accepted to the right college, like the University of Georgia or Alabama or Georgia Tech. And this family, they're just hoping that there's going to be a high school near their home somewhere so that when their kids finish the ninth or the, the, the finish middle school, if there is a middle school opportunity, that they'll be able to just get education so that they can get out of this poverty that they're in right here. And then finally, and this gripped my heart, we all had a chance to meet Wilma and her son Santos. And I started thinking about, you know, how we worry so much about you know, whether, whether our son or daughter, you know, is going to make the varsity team or is going to be on the right travel team, you know, going to be first string on this or that. This mom, every single day, goes up this mountain and she doesn't have any clean water or access to it, but she goes every single day and borrows water from a, a family who basically has told her that pretty much that's going to stop pretty soon. And her concern is, how do I just provide water for my little boy Santos? Um, you know, I think, I think all of us, honestly, we, we, all of us need to at least once or twice a year go to a place like Guatemala or go with our students to Nicaragua just to put some things in perspective. But regardless, every one of us worry at some, at some point about something. But for some people, worry is their sacred cow. 
It's their go-to emotion when things appear to be a bit off kilter in our lives or in our kids' lives. It's a sacred cow because for a lot of people, they feel like if they worry about something, then they can control it. Like they're actually in control. They have power, but we know that's not true. If anything, worry causes us to be out of control. Worry robs us of our peace. It robs us of our joy. It robs us of our contentment. And honestly, it robs us of the abundant life that Jesus longs for us to experience. Well, if anyone in the Bible had a good reason to worry, it was the Apostle Paul. Paul was a missionary church planner after he came to Christ. He was going from city to city, leading people to Jesus, making disciples, and starting new churches. And one of his favorite churches was in the city of Philippi. And he wrote a letter to them, which happens to be my favorite book in the Bible, a letter called Philippians. But Paul was troubled by something that was going on with the church at Philippi. He said, what was he troubled by and why? Well, there were church members that were disagreeing with each other and, and, and he was not there to help them. There, was, there were two women in the church, uh, Yodia and, and Syntyche, and they were fighting with each other and their conflict was bringing disunity to the church. There was also division in another church in Rome that Paul had uh, an opportunity to start as well and, and Paul was not available to address the issues that were going on in that church. Well, what, what was going on with Paul? Well, when Paul was writing this letter to the, the church in Philippi, he was in prison facing possible death, being executed. Matter of fact, while he's writing the letter, he is chained to a Roman soldier in this prison. So Paul had, he had every right in the world, good excuse to just sit there and worry, but he did not. Instead, what he did is he took time from his prison cell in Rome to explain to the church in, in, in Philippi and to us here today of how not to worry, how, how to actually tip over the sacred cow of worry. So if you have a Bible and you want to follow along with us today, turn to the book of Philippians chapter 4. Well, what is worry? Well, the Greek word for worry is translated anxious. And it literally means to be pulled in different directions. Peace and hope can pull us in one direction, but worry and fear can pull us in a different direction. And actually it can pull us apart. The old English word for worry comes from an old German word, which means to strangle. And that's exactly what worry does to us. It strangles and it chokes the life out of us. The medical field has proven that worry has definite physical consequences. That we, we can struggle with ulcers and headaches and backaches and, and sleep issues, insomnia. It can affect our thinking. It, it, it can affect our, 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 our digestion. It can even affect our coordination. But again, Maybe the biggest impact that it has on you is that it just, it robs you of your joy. It robs you of your peace. It robs you of, of your contentment and your happiness. Years ago, I read an article that said that a fog that is thick enough to cover seven city blocks 100 feet deep is composed of less than one glass of water divided into 60 million droplets. That means a few gallons of water could, could literally cripple an entire city. And that's how worry works. Usually we begin to think about something that is very small and then it just like takes on a life of its own and it begins to grow in our minds and all of a sudden it just consumes us and, and we create this monster inside of our minds that can paralyze us. Author Warren Wiersbe says that from a spiritual standpoint, worry is a combination of wrong thinking, which is in our mind, and wrong feeling, which is in our heart about circumstances, people, and things. And you've probably had people come up to you before, or, you know, a parent or whatever, and say, you know, just quit your worrying. Stop worrying about this or that. But we know that that's much easier said than done, right? Worry is a powerful joy stealer. It is a sacred, not just a, a sacred cow, it's a giant sacred cow that probably has some generational roots attached to it. Chances are, if you're a big worrier, your grandmother was a worrier, your grandfather or your mom or your dad was a big worrier. Worrier is an inside job and it takes more than good intentions to get victory over it. Well, the Apostle Paul tells us that if we're going to tip over this powerful sacred cow of worry, then we have to allow the power that we find in God and in his word and the security that we find in Jesus, we have to allow all of that to permeate our hearts and our minds. We need to allow the peace that we find in Jesus to replace the worries that are overwhelming us. We say, well, how do we do that? Well, Paul talks about this. He talks about how to tip this sacred cow of worry over so 
we can have victory over it every single day. And first thing he talks about is he says, you have to have the right kind of prayer, the right kind of praying. Verse 6 in chapter 4, he says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So Paul tells us, he says, we need to address our worries by taking everything, not just a few things, not just the big things, but everything to God in prayer, by prayer. Why, well, why prayer? Well, prayer seeks to draw resources from the invisible realm into our visible physical realm, into our reality. Every time we worry, we should see that as an invitation from God telling us, all right, it's time to pray. You're, all, you're consumed about worry? That's my invitation for you to come into my presence and let's just talk about this. Author Tony Evans lays out this principle. He says, the more you worry, the less you pray. The more you pray, the less you worry. Let me say that again. The more you worry, the less you pray. The more you pray, the less you will worry. Now, prayer is like this big umbrella word here in this instance, and it, but it carries with it the idea of worship and adoration and devotion. Whenever we find ourselves worrying, the very first thing that we should do is we should get alone with God and just worship him. You say, why? Well, because worship allows us to focus our, our minds and our hearts on God's greatness and his power. It helps us to realize that he is big enough to solve our problems, that nothing is too big for him. Nothing is outside of his reach or his power or even his authority. The apostle Paul says, if you want to pray peace into your worries, he says, don't, don't start it off by, you know, just coming into the Lord's presence and just dumping all your junk on the altar. He says, Take a moment first and get your perspective right so you know, it, you, you know who it is that you're talking to. You know that you're talking to the creator of all things, the one who is holding all things in, in his hands. And as you begin to pray about your worries and your anxieties and your fears and your unbeliefs, you, you take a moment and you get your mind around his power and his majesty and his ability and his strength. You adore him. Every day when I come into the, Lord, the Lord's presence uh, in prayer, I, I listen to a playlist of worship songs that talk about God's ability. They just talk about his power and his strength. It just helps me remind myself of who I'm speaking of, who I'm speaking to and what he's capable of. It's on my Spotify list. It's called Big Faith. And I just sit there and I just let these songs, the truth of these songs, just, just flood my mind so that I know that when I start bringing my prayers to the Lord, I know he can handle them. He's big enough to handle my, my stuff, my, my worries, my doubts. Then Paul says, come bring everything by prayer, but also by supplication, which is another word for petition. This is where we come and we share our needs and our problems. And we don't, we don't come insincere and half-hearted. No, no, we come before him with our whole heart, with spiritual intensity. Remember when Jesus, before he was arrested, he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And while his disciples were sleeping, he was praying to his father with such intensity that the Bible says he was, he, he was sweating drops of blood. What do I bring to God? Paul says, bring everything. Bring it all and be very specific about what you're bringing. When you are overwhelmed with worry, general broad prayers are just, they're not gonna do the job. You need to tell God exactly what's going on in your mind. Tell him what you're worried about and why it's consuming him. Tell him how it's impacting you. Cry out to him. Give him the depths of your heart. Listen, he can handle your thoughts and emotions. He can handle your issues. He can handle your messiness. You may, you may think that what you're thinking, what you're consumed by is just petty and maybe ridiculous, but to God it's not because it's causing you to worry. God doesn't see your issues as petty. He doesn't see them as ridiculous. He says, no, no, bring everything to me. And when you bring them, bring them with your whole heart. And it's okay. When you bring them, confess your lack of faith. Confess your unbelief. Ask me to help you. He says, God, help, help, help me to believe you more. He's listening and he's able. And then Paul does something interesting. He attaches the word. He says, by prayer, with supplication. And then he says, with thanksgiving. Now listen, prayer can be frustrating business at times. I don't know, I mean, if you've just realized before, but prayer, prayer can be frustrating. I mean, it's like, it's like going to a Coke machine and you put a coin in there and you punch the button and nothing comes out. And I don't know about you, but I've taken those, I'm like I start tipping the machine going, I'm gonna get that coin to go down to where it's supposed to go. And then it doesn't happen. Have you ever kicked one of those machines? 
I have. Thank you. Me and you. I've, thank you, brother. I'm not all alone up here, right? But listen, that's not how prayer works. Paul tells us to bring all of our worries before the Lord with thanksgiving. We're not thanking God for the problem that's causing us to worry, but we're inviting God into that specific situation. And our thanksgiving is a demonstration of faith of God's goodness and provision despite what we're seeing at the moment. You say, what can we expect when we pray this way? Here's the promise. Look at verse 7. It says, and the peace of God, I love this verse, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will do what? Guard your heart and guard your mind in Christ Jesus. In other words, you're going to experience calm in the midst of the chaos. You will know that God has heard your prayers, not necessarily because the problem has gone away or because it's solved, but because there's peace that wasn't there before. And it's a peace that only God can give you. And Paul calls it a peace that surpasses understanding because even we won't be able to understand how we are able to have peace in light of what we're dealing with, in light of the, of the troubles that we're experiencing. It's a peace that Paul says, guards your heart and it guards your mind. Now remember where Paul is, where he is when he's writing these words. He's chained to a Roman soldier, guarded all day and all night. What are the two areas that create worry inside of us? Our heart, which are, again, wrong, wrong, wrong feeling, and our, and our mind, which is wrong thinking. And Paul says the peace of God stands guard over our heart and over our mind. Now that doesn't mean an absence of trials on the outside, but what it does mean is a quiet confidence within, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of what's going on with people or things. So if you're going to see the sacred cow of worry be literally tipped over onto its head, there has to be the right kind of praying. But how do we, get, how do we, how do we hold on to that peace once we get it? Because sometimes that peace can be a, a bit fleeting, right? Here's what he says. He says we have to exercise the right kind of thinking. Peace, again, it involves the heart and the mind. And Isaiah, Isaiah says, uh, in Isaiah 26, 3, he says, you, God, speaking to God, he says, you will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. Paul, Isaiah says that when, when our hearts are permanently fixed on trusting God, then we're going to have a perfect peace in our mind. But here's what we need to know um, that is true about the mind. Wrong thinking can lead to wrong feeling. And wrong feelings will lead our hearts and our minds again to be strangled out by choke, or uh, strangled and choked out by worry. We have to realize that our thoughts, they, they, are, they are real, they are powerful, even, even when we can't see them or weigh them or measure them, they drive our emotions, which then drive our actions. And Paul tells us, he says, that we, we, we are, we're gonna, we're gonna, the only way we're going to hold on to our peace is we have to think about the right things. Now, what does that look like? Well, here's a good grocery list of the way that we need to be thinking if we're going to have peace over our worries. Paul says in verse 8, he says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any... Any, uh, if there's any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So here's what Paul says. He says, think about things that are true. Now, it's no secret that our minds can lie to us and deceive us. Over 40 years ago, the, nat uh, the Natural Foundation for Science hired a, a doctor by the name of Walter Calvert to study the issue of worry and the impact that worry had on people. And so Dr. Calvert spent a few years surveying over million, many millions of people and here's what he found out. He found out that only 8% of things that we worry and stress over are actually true. That means that 90, 92% of the things we stress out over are either imaginary or they never happened or they are matters that we actually have no control over. There's nothing we can do about those things. But here's the thing, sometimes it's hard for us to figure out what is true and what's part of that 92% because that 92% can be pretty, enticing, pretty uh, convincing, can it? So, what is true? Well, as we mentioned last week, Satan is a master liar and deceiver. All right? In the New Testament book of John, Jesus is debating some Jewish leaders, uh, religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees. And, and he says to them in John chapter 8, verse 44, he says, you belong to your father, the devil, 
(laughs) and you want to carry out your father's desires, he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. And when he lies, he speaks his native tongue, for he is a liar and he is the father of lies. Now you're thinking, man, that is strong language. Why would Jesus speak in such strong terms to these religious leaders? What what, what was going on here? Well, they were being blinded by lies. They, they, They couldn't see the truth because they were being deceived by Satan. And Jesus says, listen, when Satan lies, he is speaking out of his character. It's his native tongue. And he doesn't just lie, he is the father of lies. And he is constantly at work in the world right now, blinding people from the truth that will lead them into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He's doing everything he can to deceive and lie, put up, put up blinders. But he's also deceiving and lying and blinding those who profess to be followers of Jesus from things that would bring us freedom, things that would cause us to be set free from some of the bondage that we're dealing with. And he's also blinding us, trying to blind us from leading us to becoming more fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. That led the Apostle Paul to write this to the believers in Corinth. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, he says, But I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Now, I've noticed that any time that I'm wavering in my intimacy with Jesus, it's because I've bought into a thought that's not true whether it's about a circumstance, a thing, a a person, something. I've bought into a lie from Satan. And we all struggle here, don't we? Matter of fact, it's a daily battle. 1 John chapter 5 verse 6 tells us that the Holy Spirit controls our minds through truth. However, Satan will try to control your mind through lies. And whenever we believe a lie, what we do is we we allow an opportunity for Satan to come in and to take over, to take control, to take ground that doesn't actually belong to him. What, what, what kind of lies do, do we give into? Well, it could be a lie about a particular sin. We may look at that sin and go, you know, it's really not a big deal. It's not hurting anybody. It's not hurting me. God's letting me get away with it, so it must be okay. It's a lie. It could be a lie about someone else. We just create things in our minds about people. And we just let a little thing become a big thing and then it just grows into this monster and they become an enemy inside of our minds. And yet the whole time it's a lie. It could be a lie about ourselves. That somehow we just think, you know what? I'm just worthless. I am, I am, I'm I'm less than, I'm no good. I'm, I'm messy. I'm all this, all this and that. See, whenever we believe a lie, here's what happens. Satan takes ground from our lives that does not belong to him. He doesn't own it, but he's like setting up shop on it. And he sets up shop on that ground and then he goes to work to try to influence our thoughts further until he can influence our actions and our habits and our character. Why? Ultimately to destroy us. And listen, just so you know, if, if, if you've got 100 yards in your life and he sets up shop on five, he's not stopping there. He's going to go for 10 more and 10 more and 10 more until he's controlling everything. And we have to declare war on Satan's battle against our mind. And so what Paul says is we have to think about the right things. And first of all, we have to think on things that are true. Well, where do we find truth? We find truth in God's word. John chapter 8, verse 31, 32 says, The Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will do what? It will set you free. Jesus says, If you will hold to his teaching, then you'll know the truth. And when you know the truth, it has the ability to bring freedom into your life to set you free from the lies, from the worry, from the doubt, from the unbelief. The other way we can know truth is through the Holy Spirit. 1 John chapter 5, 6 is, and it is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is what? Truth. The Holy Spirit testifies on behalf of God the things that are true. He will reveal to us the things that we can bank our lives on. Now, here's what you need to know about the Holy Spirit. He will never put anything into your mind that contradicts God's word. He will never tell you something or try to enlighten you or to put something in your path that goes against God's word. But instead, he will put truth into your mind that will help you wage war against Satan's lies. And here, listen, we need to have verses in our our arsenal all the time about four areas of our life. The truth about God. Satan's going to lie about God to you all the time. We need to have verses 
to combat those lies. We need to have truth about God's plan and purpose for our lives because Satan is going to try to speak lies into those things. We need to have verses ready to fight him with. We need to have uh, some verses about the truth about, our, about ourselves because Satan's going to lie to us all the time about ourselves. We need to be able to throw truth right back in his faith. He can't, he can't handle truth. And then we need to have some, some things about other people because that's kind of where we, a lot of us struggle. Our minds are a playground for all kinds of bad things that we think about other people. And once you've found the truth from God's words in those four areas, you use them. You speak, those, you speak the, that truth into those areas. You meditate on those verses. Why? Because they have power. They are the very words of God. When, sp- when Satan speaks li- speak lies over you, you speak truth of, the, truth of God's worth right back at him. He can't handle it. Listen, this is war that we are in. And spiritual battles can only be fought with spiritual weapons. If you try to fight all this in your own strength, you're going to lose every single time. You're just not that good. I'm not that good. None of us are. So we've got to think on things that are true. Then think on things that are honorable and just. This means that think, we need to think on things that are worthy of respect and things that are right. There are a lot of things out there in the world that are simply not honorable and not respectable. And Paul says, if you're a follower of Jesus, don't put your mind on those things. Don't focus on them. Those things will rob you of your peace if you focus your mind on them. Now, that doesn't mean that we stick our our head in the sand, you know, about everything that's going on around us. But what, what Paul's saying is don't allow your mind to focus on things that would bring dishonor to God and then allow those things to control your thoughts. And then he says, think about things that are pure. Now, when Paul wrote this to the church in Philippi, they were under Roman influence. And Roman culture was immersed in sexual perversion. There were naked statues everywhere. There were sex parties going on. There, were, there, were, there was all kinds of immorality going on in public bathhouses. It was a very sensual, jacked up place. And so there would have been temptation for these believers everywhere they turned. Listen, I cannot think of anything that would destroy the, your peace of mind more than moral impurity. Matter of fact, if you're a Christ follower and you're currently battling just with impure thoughts or you're struggling with pornography, you're probably living in constant turmoil. You're probably dealing with worry and stress and anxiety and all kinds of doubts. Why? Because impure thoughts grieve the spirit of God. There cannot be ongoing inner peace in our lives when we're sinning against the one who brings us peace in the first place. So we've got to think about things that are pure. Then Paul says, think about things that are lovely. Okay? This is the, the word for, for lovely is this word prosphiles. And it, it's the only time it's used in the Bible. And it means to think about things that would promote peace rather than conflict. Have you ever met someone before? Don't think about them, but you probably will anyways. But have you ever met someone who, they just love conflict? I mean, they just live for it. It's like you say white, they say black. You say go, they say stop. You say right, they say left. You look and go, man, that glass glass right there is half, it it is full and overflowing. And they're like, no, it's half full. You know, you you just want to, you just want to, Anyways, there, there, there's just nothing attractive about that, is there? You know, and, but there are people in, the, in our lives that, that, that we just, they're always in con- we, conflict. We see those people all the time on social media, right? I mean, you could be talking about something really awesome and, and five things down on Facebook, there they are. And they bring their negative stuff into the conversation just trying to pick a fight over something that wasn't even fight worthy. I mean, it's just crazy. Why? Because they always want to debate and challenge and bring conflict into a situation. And after a while, you look at that person and think, man, it must be really tough to be you. Because you realize that person, inside of them, there's constant turmoil. And Jesus found that in the Pharisees. They were the religious, again, the religious leaders of the day. They were trapped in legalism. They were trapped in moralism. There was just all, it didn't matter what Jesus said. Everything he said, they tried to to come back at him and create conflict with him. They were what we call the haters of the day. And Paul says, don't let your mind focus on those things that would motivate, let your mind focus instead on things that would motivate love rather than conflict. Focus on the positive instead of the negative. People that are positive are much more attractive to be around than people who are just always negative. 
listen, there, there's nothing wrong with being analytical. There's nothing wrong with being a critical thinker. Or, you know, but, but when you are always creating conflict or you are stirring up strife or you're stirring up trouble or you're playing the devil's advocate, which is another word for just being the devil, you listen, <laughs> people, will, people will eventually cut you off. They will unfollow you. They will, you will lose your influence. They will stop listening to you because they will see you as a joy stealer. And so Paul says, think about things that are lovely. Think about things that would motivate love. And then he says, think about things that are commendable. In other words, think about things that are worth talking about. Real simple, don't think about trashy things that lead to trashy talk. Colossians chapter 4, verse 6, Paul writes this to the church of Colossae. He says, let your conversation be always full of grace seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. See, we forget sometimes that God hears our conversations. Paul says, think about things that you would want God to hear, things, about, things that would make him proud to be part of your conversation. Then he says, think about things that are excellent and praiseworthy. Excellent thoughts motivate us to do better, okay? Praiseworthy thoughts cause others to do better. Think of how much time we spend allowing our minds dr to drift into thoughts that just tear us down, things that, that just make us feel bad about ourselves. Think of how much more time we spend dwelling on negative thoughts about other people. Most of the time, we, we, people don't even know we're thinking garbage thoughts about them because most of the time we try to, we're, we're nice to their face. But who ends up suffering for those kind of negative thoughts? We do in every single way. As, and so as followers of Jesus, we cannot afford to dwell on things that would tear us down or to tear others down. There's enough of that going on in the world right now today, right? Our calling on this earth here is, to, is, is so much greater than to allow our minds to be trapped in the negative or to be wrapped up in turmoil or to allow our thoughts to lead us into gossip or backstabbing or the need to know the latest scoop on so-and-so so we can tell someone else. No, no, no. All that does is rob us of our joy and steal our peace from us and lead us into wrong thinking, which again, leads us into wrong feeling, which tears us apart inside and just leads us to worry. So how do I condition my mind to think about things that are true and honorable and just and pure and lovely and excellent and commendable and worthy of praise? Listen to the words of King David in Psalm chapter 19 and notice, I want you to notice the parallel here to what David says. David wrote this thousands and thousands of years ago. He says, the instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The commandments of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are clear, giving insight for living. Reverence for the Lord is pure, lasting forever. The laws of the Lord are true, each one is fair. And David, King David, is say, he's just saying, he says, when you fill your mind with God's word, it revives your soul. It makes the simple wise. It brings joy to our hearts. It, it gives light to our eyes. In other words, when you fill your mind with God's word, you have a built-in radar for detecting wrong thoughts, things that would make you worry. I remember in the late 80s, early 90s, when the, when the, when the first Gulf War started, I was in seminary in Philadelphia. And I was, we were all gathered. I, was, I had a class, and the professor let us out of class, and we were all gathered in the library. There was a TV in there, and we were watching TV. And I remember when Iraq started started shooting missiles at Israel. Do you remember, you remember the name of the, the, of the missiles they were shooting? It was the Scuds. It's a good name for those missiles, right? Scud, all right? And do you remember what the U.S. countered with? The Patriot. I like that, the Patriot missile. The Patri God's word is like a Patriot missile, right thoughts. Every time a Scud, a wrong thought comes into your mind, and wants to rob you of your peace and, and, and to cause you to worry, what do you do? You counter with one of God's patriots' missiles. You shoot that scud right out of the sky. And here's the promise. In Psalm chapter one, uh, 119, 165, David writes, abundant peace belongs to those who love your instruction. Nothing makes them stumble. So if we're gonna tip over these sacred cows of worry onto its side, there has to be right prayer, there has to be right thinking. But Paul mentions one more thing here. Right prayer and right thinking will always result in the right kind of living. He says in verse 9, he says, What you have learned and received and you have heard and seen in me, practice these things. And I love this. He says, And the God of peace will be with you. 
the God of peace will be with you. Paul says, we have a responsibility here. We are to take everything that we've learned and everything that we've seen and everything that we've, excuse me, received and everything that we have heard and seen and we have to put it into practice. We have to live it out. We have to put right praying and right thinking into practice. And what does God promise when, when we do those things? He says, the God of peace will be with you. When you, are, when you are praying and thinking and choosing to live the right way, we, just don't, we, we don't just have the peace of God, we have the God of peace. We get his peace and we also get his presence. When I was um, about four years old, my, my mom and dad moved our family outside of Detroit, about a mile outside of the Detroit city limits into a little town uh, called Redford. And we moved into this little Cape Cod house and my brother Kevin was born and he came home from the hospital to that house. But um, we, in our house, we had a basement and I was scared to death of that basement, all right? In that basement was everything that was bad in the world. I mean, there was all kinds of things going on in my mind about what was going on in that basement down there. There was monsters of every kind, all right? And I would, I would lay in bed at night, all right, on the, on the main level of this house, and, and I would think about what was going on below me in that basement, how there were monsters down there in the dark, how there was just bad people down there. I mean, it's, as a little boy, my mind was just overwhelmed with just worry and fear about what was happening in that basement. And to make things worse, um, in order to go into that basement, you had to, the, the light switch for the basement was at the bottom of the steps, all right? Now, who designs a house like that, all right? People that hate kids, all right? So, so, but, so you would, we would access the basement from our kitchen, and so you'd walk down a couple stairs, and you'd be on a landing, and then all of a sudden, there they were, the stairs leading down into the darkness. And I used to stand there as a little boy just scared to death, because my, my mom would go, okay, can you go get something from the basement? No. But I'd stand there and I'd get my courage up and I would, I would run down those steps as quickly as possible and I'd hit that light switch and hopefully nothing would take me out. But one day my dad realized, uh, he knew that I, that I was just overwhelmed with fear and worry about what was going on down in that basement. And so one day he, he came to me and said, let's go down in the basement together. And, and I'm like, why are, we, why are we going down there? He says, I just want to go down there with you for just a moment. And so we walked down to the, down the stairs and instead of hitting the light switch, he just kept it off and he said, hey, let's walk over here for a moment. And we walked across the basement, it was just cold and it was dark and he held my hand. And we just sat there on a couch for what seemed to be an eternity to me. And he held my hand real tight. He didn't lecture me didn't shame me, I didn't make fun of me, didn't tease me. But we just sat there and we talked about my life as a little boy. Probably talked about baseball and sports and whatever little girl I thought was cute at school or whatever was going on. And as long as I sat there with him, I didn't need to worry. I didn't need to be, didn't need to be afraid of what I thought was going on in that basement. And I found out nothing was going on down there because my dad was with me. His presence brought me peace. And it also helped to, to recondition my thinking, which then allowed me to be able to go into that basement by myself without fear or worry that somehow something bad or something terrible was going to happen to me. Listen, the same is true with us and God. The God who not only brings peace to us, but Paul says is the God of peace. He holds our hand when we're worried and he says, come on, let's walk into this together. Okay, it may not take the problem away, it's still dark, but you know he's with you and he can handle it. And you're good, you have peace as long as you're partnered up to the God of peace. You can walk into your fears. You can walk into your doubts. You can walk into the things that overwhelm you that are going on with your kids right now that just wear you out. You just hold on to dad's hand and you just walk into those things and you remind yourself of how big he is and how he's got it all under control. And then you just start telling yourself the truth and you combat the lies 
Listen. God doesn't ask us to tip over these sacred cows, any of them, and especially the sacred cow worry all on our own. He's given us everything that we need in Jesus. And when we build our life on the right kind of praying and the right kind of thinking and the right kind of living, we can rest knowing that God is in control. We, we, and so today, here's the deal. If you're, if you're sick and tired of just trying in your own strength to, to just tip that sacred cow over of worry on your own, I'm here to tell you today, you don't have to do that. The God who not only brings peace, but who is the God of peace, will tip it over for you. Just grab his hand and let him walk you into it. I want you to bow your head for just a moment. We're gonna do something that we don't typically do here at Westridge. um, And I'm gonna ask you to do something that I rarely ever ask you to do. I wanna ask you just as we sing, I want you just to stay seated. Okay, I'm not trying to rob you of your worship time. I just want you just to sit before the Lord for a moment. Sit with dad holding your hand for just a moment if you could. Imagine that you're, you're sitting on the couch with the best dad you can imagine. And he's got you by the hand. And you're sitting in the darkness and you're full of your worries and your fears and your doubts and all of the things that cause you unbelief. And he's got you. And as you're there, just tell him. Tell him all the things you're worried about. Tell him all the things that are wearing you out. Tell him all the things that are robbing you of your joy and stealing your, your peace. Tell him all the things that you're afraid of concerning your future, all the uncertainties that you're feeling, all the doubts. And just let him minister to you right now. And if you're here today and maybe you've never received this God of peace into your life to be your personal savior through his son, Jesus Christ, today's your day. Just pray with me at this moment. Say, God of peace, Right now, I ask you to be my savior. What Jesus Christ did for me on the cross brought peace between me and you. You became the God of peace at this very moment as I put my faith and my trust and my life in your hands. And Jesus took away, he took away the issue that stood between us, which is sin. And the only way I can have peace with you is by placing all of my faith and all of my trust and my future in the hands of Jesus who paid for all of that on the cross. And there's no other way except through Jesus that I can know salvation. So today I say yes to this offer of forgiveness and new life. And I place all my faith and trust in the one who gave his life for me. Thank you. If you just did that, I want you just to look at me for a moment. I want you to get out your phone, text the word follow to 770-222-2125.